Thank you so much, Ms. Carroll. Good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be with you this morning, and uh, just to come to the conclusion of a very busy week, which I've seen many of you throughout this week here, uh, serving faithfully, uh, not just on Sunday morning, but being here uh, for our Vacation Bible School and, and other things, and for that, uh, very thankful uh, to each of you. Uh, if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we are continuing in our study of Christ's Sermon on the Mount uh, as we're studying through the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, so far, I, I believe we've had a great time uh, in our specific study of the, of the Sermon on the Mount thus far. Just a quick recap to kind of catch us back up. It's been uh, many months in this study. But in chapter 5, uh, we had the opportunity as we began to see the true character and lifestyle of a kingdom member and the Beatitudes that Christ gave us. We were able to recognize the reason for these characteristics uh, in the life we're called to live, to be one which is salt and light. We've been taught about Christ's fulfillment of the law, while also being taught about the law's continuance and goodness to us as a tutor which points us unto Christ. We have seen the righteousness of Christ and his kingdom sharply contrasted with the worldly unhypocr er, <clears throat> the righteousness self-righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and the six illustrations Christ gave us to show that point at the conclusion of chapter 5 through the course of that showing for all intents and purposes the mind or how we are to think and view this world unhypocritically as kingdom members often repeatedly saying uh, in each of those illustrations you have heard it said or you have come to believe but let me clarify and correct that because it's a perverted tradition you've been given and not the truth and the purity of God's word so we saw that we're how we're to believe and how we're to view uh, these things and then in chapter 6 we were beginning to be taught how to act in our religious deeds unhypocritically as kingdom members specifically as it pertains to our relationships number one our relationship to others and our giving number two our relationship to our Lord and our praying and then we're finding ourselves today in our relationship to ourselves and our fasting in each morning uh, in each our Lord warns us against hypocrisy in our actions and seeking to please men and be recognized by men in our pursuits while also teaching us how rather we should practice these deeds this morning we came to the come to the fascinating section on fasting specifically dealing again with hypocrisy or the potential for it in this pursuit indeed and calling us to act rightly as kingdom members with an eye towards God in every arena of our lives now fasting is a term that I've, I've grown up hearing uh, it's a term that if you've been in the church for any length of time or read the Bible uh, it's a term that you would recognize or, or see on a regular basis uh, being spoken of and, and yet uh, often the church or, or, or those it's a, it's a vague term that honestly seems to be somewhat lost in our generation uh, just mentioning it and, and speaking through those things oftentimes if you were to mention fasting uh, most people can give you some type of a functional definition uh, of this very simply it's the forsaking of something for a specific purpose or, or those things but then asked well how do you view it in light of this scripture or or those things oftentimes there's kind of a blank stare uh, that comes back in it, and I understand that it's not something that is only new in our generation uh, to quote dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, from several or many years ago he says this for evangelicals this whole question of fasting has almost disappeared from our lives and is even out of the field of our consideration in other words it doesn't even really cross our mind it's not something that ever really comes across our mind and to go back a little bit further roughly 500 years ago listen to the words of one of our reformers when they said this many for want of knowing its usefulness undervalue its necessity and some reject it altogether as superfluous while on the other hand where the proper use of fasting is not well understood it easily degenerates into superstition and I think man there's really nothing new under the Sun 500 years ago we have a pastor giving a very apt description of what his generation was facing that I would say is very closely uh, in line with what I would describe our understanding of fasting in this generation to be frank it truly seems to be misunderstood misused 
or just plain avoided in the Christianity that we live within in the Christian faith. And so I am excited for us to learn more about this practice that is frequently spoken of in Scripture, that is oftentimes recognized by Christians, and to also see that this was in fact so common in the mindset of the authors of Scripture that it is often spoken of with, with little or no explanation. Rather, there being an assumption that the reader would be familiar with this practice as it is given. So read with me our text for our study this morning. It begins in Matthew 6, verse 16. Our Lord says this, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. And truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. A very familiar statement that we've seen in the other aspects as well. Verse 17, But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now just a quick reminder, as we noted back at the beginning of our study of Matthew's Gospel, which by the way, in looking back to see that reference, that was about 14 months ago, uh, and that was 46 sermons ago. This is our 47th sermon in Matthew's Gospel. And we recognize at the beginning of this that Matthew's Gospel is written with a heavy Jewish orientation, often using terms and phrases with the assumption that the reader will readily know and therefore grasp their intent. Which means that we today have to dig a little deeper for understanding before we just jump into practice. In our text at the beginning of verse 16, Matthew records our Lord as saying, Whenever you fast. Which is a clear communication as we've seen that fasting was an expected practice for his disciples. This was something that, that would have been some expectation of his. And we recognize that, that there was some controversy over this as the disciples were not those who were observing some of the traditional fasts that were given. And our Lord corrected that uh, confrontation when he said to them, Shall they indeed fast while the bridegroom is with them? Uh, meaning this, that fasting, as we'll see, was, was for uh, very specific purposes. And so in that, uh, this was an expected practice of his disciples. It's one that they weren't practicing in the fullest sense of tradition, although uh, I would say that I do believe they definitely practiced it on the Day of Atonement. We'll see that was commanded uh, in Scripture. It's the only place, by the way, that commands fasting uh, on a very specific day. And so when our Lord says, whenever you fast... He was communicating that it was an expected practice for his disciples. It was something he not only expected them to know about, it was something he expected them to be practicing or doing. So with that, in my limited knowledge in some ways of this, one that again has been a very vague understanding, one that, that as I was pleased to find with a little background study wasn't wrong, it just was somewhat incomplete. Uh, so I did a little background study on the Jewish practice and therefore a greater understanding of fasting. And I have to tell you, it was extremely helpful for me in understanding this practice and the text we're in better. And so I want to share a little bit of it with you. Now, <clears throat> you won't get the fullness of it, but these are some high points that stood out to me in understanding it. Jewish fasting incorporated both a corporate fasting time, and it also had numerous individual fasts that were expected within it. However, as I mentioned earlier, we should know ahead of time the only place fasting was commanded in all of Scripture on a very specific time frame was the Day of Atonement. And that's very significant for us. Look with me at Leviticus chapter 23. It'll be on the screen. We're not going to spend a lot of time here. But what we see is that the Old Testament laws given through Moses was commanding self-denial of all the Israelite people on this, the Day of Atonement. The day whereby the high priest would go and make atonement for the sins of the people in the Holy of Holies. And in Leviticus chapter 3, 23, beginning in verse 26, we see this account. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, On exactly the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. And you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire unto the Lord. You shall not do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. And if there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from his people. As for any person who does any work on this same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. 
You shall do no work at all. It is to be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and all of your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you. And you shall humble your souls on the ninth of the month at evening. From evening until evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Now, understanding this fully, that this time of self-denial that the Lord commanded for a very specific time included for the Israelites abstinence from eating and drinking for this time period from evening until evening. Abstinence from sexual activity, from washing, anointing, or even the putting on of sandals. So we recognize this was a, a corporate fast that was commanded in Scripture for a very specific time and season. We rec also, in reading, I found out that corporate fasts were later required for other occasions as well in Jewish tradition. Number one, the Jewish New Year. During the time of the Jewish New Year, the people are required to fast in observance of it. Also, there are two specific days where there's a remembrance of the Jewish calamities of their past. The 17th day of the month of Tammuz and the 9th day of the month of Ab, recognizing distinct tragedies in their history, such as the shattering of the stone tablets, the divine refusal to allow Israel to enter the promised land, and the destruction of the temple. And so on these two specific days, the people were to fast in, in mourning and recognition of these tragedies that were a part of their national history. And so it was a national or corporate time of fasting. The point is, is that all the fasts that we see, all true fasts, were an expression of, of grief and mourning, or they were demonstrations of repentance and need. There seems to be three abuses of fasting which commonly sprang up in its practice. Scripture is continually uh, pointing us to these abuses and warning the people who are familiar with the practice how not to do it. The first one I want to look at this morning is how fasting or the practice of these things can become mechanical. They can become that which we do by rote or tradition alone. It can be something that, that without any real forethought or, or actual practice of a right practice in it, we just do it because we always have. And now that's not necessarily something we face, although it could become that. And we'll look at some ways in which it still stands today. But recognize there is a danger in a prescribed anything. But this morning we're talking about fast, which negates the true intent behind them and instead makes them a mechanical ritual or tradition. It's something we're not exempt from in any way today. These types of fasting develop no long-term action in the lives of those who practice them. And they have no value before the Lord. Uh, Brother Larry read from Isaiah 58. If you want to turn there, we're just going to look briefly at it. In Isaiah 58, uh, we have a description where the, where the Lord speaks and it fits this. It, it gives us an understanding of, of what I mean when I say that, that this type of fasting, this mechanical, well, this is what we do in these situations. I open the manual and it said do this so I can check that box off and now I'm waiting for, for the fulfillment of it. And yet there's no long-term value in the life of the one who's practicing this and it has zero value before the Lord. In Isaiah 58, just looking at verses 3 through 7, we won't read all of it. We have this picture where, where it's the people of Israel saying, and the Lord responding to them saying, Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? And he says this, Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire. And so what the Lord's saying is you're doing this out of a purpose to, to find what you desire to receive from me, those things. And he says, And drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes of the bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? And so the picture that we're starting to see is, is they were doing this because they wanted something specific. And that something specific they wanted was in relationship to them. They wanted to receive more income, more driving of their workers, more of the continuance of what they were pursuing and were struggling with in this season. And the Lord says this, is this not the fast which I choose? And it's a fast that produces action. It's one that is simply a picture of the accomplishment. The, the action, I mean, that the Lord would desire to loosen the bonds of wickedness, 
to undo the bands of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? And we don't have time to go through all of that this morning, but what we see is that a true fast before the Lord is one that is a recognition, a realization resulting in a foregoing of oneself and an obedience rather to the Lord. In, in other words, it is to be something that has long-term action flowing from it. Whereas if you do it mechanically, if you do it by rote or tradition, it doesn't result in that. It just means that you forsake certain things for just that season and then go right back to what you were doing before directly afterwards. That's the mechanical aspect. It doesn't lead to long-term obedience or long-term recognition of the Lord. A common example of this mechanical practice today would be the season of Lent, which hundreds of millions of people observe faithfully every year. Many observe it as a way of keeping a tradition and displaying before God their devotion, even while oftentimes the rest of their year is devoid of any devotion to Him. It's a practice they grew up with. It's one that they find value in. It's one that might, for that season, bring about a greater sense of devotion, and then it goes its way as soon as the season ends. And to understand this, be aware, it's not as though we are ourselves devoid of any of this. How many within the profession of Christianity or those who make professions of faith observe devotion to God and His bride at Christmas and Easter traditionally? For those two specific seasons, they, they wake up on that weekend and say, Oh, I must do... But there's no long-term reality displayed in it. It's simply the observance of a tradition or ritual. And recognizing that, as we saw, it is only commanded specifically one time for observance in the Scriptures. There was a very specific command we saw in Leviticus where a time of self-denial for the people of Israel on the Day of Atonement. That's the day, and we recognize that for us as Christians, because that was the only commandment given to observe a fast, for us as Christians, our fasting is one that will always be a voluntary act. Always. It's not a commanded duty for the Christian. It's not one which we are commanded to partake and participate in any way. How do I know that? Well, very simply, there's only one place it's commanded. It's commanded for the Day of Atonement. Well, the atonement for sin has once for all been accomplished in our Savior's sacrifice. And so we do not observe any form of compulsory fasting. It is nowhere commanded for God's people in all of Scripture that on any specific days or seasons we are to practice fasting. A true fast is one that carries with it the action accompanying repentance. Displaying is we recognize that repentance means a changing of mind. And that when your mind is changed, so therefore will your actions pursue after this change of mind or this new mind that is within it. And so a true fast carries action long term, displaying the change of mind, which is accompanied by a change of action which lasts long beyond any ritual. You don't stop loving Jesus and pursuing his will for your life simply because the season of your sacrifice is ended. It is an action which displays a love for God rather than a love for self and this world and its goods. Now with that being the foundation, that, it, that it's one which is not to be done mechanically, let's take a step back and see more even this step before that. Another abuse of fasting which commonly sprang up and was uh, dealt with in Scripture is a fasting that stems from false repentance. False repentance. Now I understand that, that false action will oftentimes show itself because of false repentance or, or short-term action. Now, this danger is very similar to the first one we looked at, whereby the mechanical nature of it can lead to external actions only being expressed apart from any real internal change. In the Old Testament, God warned about hypocritical fasting. He warned about hypocritical mourning. He warned about false repentance numerous times. Uh, one such is recorded for us by the prophet Joel. It'll, it'll be on the screen. Just follow along with these two verses as the Lord deals with his people Israel through his prophet once again. In Joel chapter 2 verse 12, Yet even now 
declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping, and mourning. These are familiar words throughout the Old Testament. In verse 13, he gives the warning, and rend your heart and not your garments. Rend your heart and not your garments. You see, the, the picture that the Lord's giving is, I, I don't want your external sacrifice. I don't want your external fasting, weeping, and mourning, dealing with it simply because you don't like the judgment that's coming. Simply because you don't like the circumstances you find yourself in. No, if it is to be a true fast, it is one that comes from a heart that has been rended, a heart that is recognizing sin. Now return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. And so what is clearly in sight and to be avoided is to simply do a religious deed externally and mechanically in order to get what is desired from God. He says, don't just try and put these practices forth to get back from you what you desire. It's uh, an illustration that we use oftentimes to, to understand understand this as we describe prayer and other functions of hypocrisy in our religious pursuits and, and actions of faith, is to understand that God's not your soda machine. Right? That, that's the practice that kind of is being displayed here. This idea that, that if we put in the prescribed amount in order to receive back what it is that we desire, and it's hypocrisy at its highest level. It, it's, it's, it's a wrong understanding of the character of our God. And his role in our lives. And so this is the picture that in the same way that if I go up to a soda machine and I, I know that I need to put a dollar twenty five in to get back the drink that I want, I don't get it back if I put in a dollar. I have to put in the prescribed amount to get it back. Well, when we begin to view God in this way, we begin to view him as he himself is not. We begin to make him fit our desires, our pursuits, and our passions. And so this is one of the highest forms of hypocrisy, and, and we need to recognize it when it happens. Do not do your religious deeds as though somehow that will accomplish for you the giving of your desires that you request of God. That is not what fasting was ever to accomplish. We'll see that more fully. But it is an abuse that oftentimes springs up in every arena. So many times I'll see people who have a desire for something specific or they're in the midst of a consequence or, Lord, I, I just don't want this to happen or I don't, I don't want my spouse uh, to leave me. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want this. Or maybe it's something of, of more proactive. Lord, I, I really want this promotion. And so people will suddenly begin to show up in church like every time the doors are open. They'll begin to read their Bible every morning. And their prayer life, and, and it will look something like this, where they're saying, Lord, I am doing all that you have asked. Now, please bless me in this area of, of desire and struggle that I have. That's the soda machine analogy, where we're putting into our Lord so that we might get back from him. And he says, don't do these things. The third abuse or danger commonly associated with fasting is the one which our Lord expresses in our text this morning. The desire for human recognition uh, human recognition as the motivation and the internal aspect of why we do the things that we do. This could also surprisingly come through the corporate fasting as well as the individual practice. That even when, when Israel was in the process of a corporate fast, that there could be a measure where human recognition sprang to the forefront. Because these fasts could also be mandated specifically for the people during times of national crisis. Things like droughts famine, military attack, etc., disease, things that were coming through, the judgment of the Lord oftentimes. And during, during these corporate fasts in the face of crisis, interestingly enough, they would become more intense as time went on until God brought relief. In their initial stages, the people were allowed food and drink after nightfall. They were also allowed to work, bathe, anoint themselves, put on sandals, and have sexual relations with their spouses. In the final stages, when things got more desperate, when the army was on the horizon, when the crops were drying up, you fill in the blank, these activities also became forbidden among the people. Now Israel, recognizing certain elements of facing potential crisis, for example, the normal dry season. The normal dry season in their region comes every year, but if it's prolonged, it could spell disaster because they were an agricultural society wholly dependent upon the growth of their crops for survival. And so in recognition of that, what they would do is they would have a specific group among their people 
who would begin fasting in preparation for the dry season. These individuals, they had it down to a science. They would observe three days of fasting on Monday, Thursday, and on the following Monday at the beginning of their preparation. This timetable was developed to prevent upsetting local economies during the fast. Now, how did they choose the people who were going to fast on behalf of the nation? How did they go about that? Well, what oftentimes happened is that these people were the ones who were deeply respected for their piety and for the sacrifice that they were making on behalf of the nation. We read about in the time of prayer that they would ask for the one to pray whom they knew had children and whose cupboard was empty because they knew their prayer would be urgent. And so in the temple, they would call upon this person with these specific qualifications to pray. Well, in the same way, they would call upon those who they recognized in leadership specifically as being the most pious among them. This practice and the respect associated with it, in other words, to be the one chosen to fast on behalf of the nation was a great honor and a sign of great recognition of your piety. Is probably, this probably played a factor in the warning we have from Christ about seeking to be noticed by men. It's a hard thing when you are chosen because of some character within you, not to want others to realize and recognize that. Oftentimes the fasting were accompanied by other acts. If you read scripture, you know that there's a putting on of sackcloth, a putting ashes upon your head and upon your faith, face. Now clearly, if suddenly you show up with ashes on your head and on your face, these are signs which can clearly be seen by others, signifying the act of fasting, the act of mourning, the act of, uh, of, of going before the Lord on behalf of the people possibly, or on your own. Now, think about this for just a moment. These visible actions played into the desire of men's heart to be recognized by others. In verse 16 of our text, there's a word play in the Greek which is lost in our English translation. It's, it's a really interesting and fascinating one. And what we see in that, listen as we read verse 16 again, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. Now what it's describing there is simply this recognition of woe is me being written all over your face so that people would recognize, oh, oh, he's in the midst of fasting. What a, what a good and righteous man that is. Oh, he's in the midst of fasting. There must be something going on. Maybe he has a need that we can meet. And it was all of these different things of recognition. But listen how it goes forth. And it says this, For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Now there are two verbal forms here in the Greek that share the same root and yet have opposite meanings. The word for they neglect in the literal translation means to disappear. It means to disappear, and the phrase, they will be noticed, means to appear. So they're the opposite thing stemming from the same root, and ironically what's being said is that the hypocrites covered their faces or made them to disappear so that they may appear to men. It's this recognition, and so in the Greek it shows clearly that their purpose or the intent in fasting was primarily for others to recognize that they were fasting. Now, why would this be important? Well, we recognize it in our day. Hey, we've talked about this when, when we studied on Wednesday night in, in our study of humility, that it's very difficult to do acts that are specific before the Lord that receive no recognition from our fellow man. It's one of the greatest struggles that we have is for humility to be the attitude of our lifestyle as we're described in Philippians 2. Hey, recognizing that, what we see is that in this, if someone saw that you were fasting, then it comes from either one of two sources. They would either recognize you as a person of great piety and sacrifice, thereby garnering their respect and appreciation, as you possibly fasted on behalf of them and the nation, or it could possibly be in such a way which caused men to regard your humble condition and to feel pity on your behalf as one who has suffered loss. Uh-oh, woe is him. It's obvious that he's going through a great trial, that there's great mourning, and, and we need to, to, to somehow just feel sorry for this person. And so each of them falls into this category of fasting and making it known with the purpose of garnering men's attention. And both are an absolute display 
of a hypocritical heart and motivation, which our Lord says, do not be like those who would do that. More than that, our Lord says that those who would do such a thing have the reward in full. And as we move forward in chapter 6, we'll see fully that we are to be those who are laying up treasure, not here, but in heaven. And our Lord says that those who practice these hypocritical things get their reward here in an earthly sense in its fullest. Now, to be clear, in spite of the dangers associated with hypocritical fasting, it was and still is a legitimate form of worship and devotion for God's children. It, recognize that. We've looked at all the common abuses that pop up in Scripture, but it does not negate that our Lord expected it of His disciples. And more than just that, it is referenced in the New Testament some 30 times. And almost all are favorable to the practice, with the exception of what we're seeing here in our Lord's uh, warning to not be hypocritical in it. So I want to spend our time remaining understanding a proper view of, fa of fasting and the practice of it. The first thing to understand is it is not prescribed, therefore it is the reaction of a person internally who desires God more than self. It, to put it simply, understand it's, it's a forsaking of things that self desires. It, it's a forsaking of things that self desires. And so understanding that it's no longer prescribed in a specific day or an annual practice of the Day of Atonement, it therefore must in fact be the reaction of a person internally who desiring God more than self is displaying that externally. And by externally, I don't mean showing it before men. Externally, I mean in the sense that they're doing actions physically which carry this out. I will say this. There has been too much mysticism attached wrongly to fasting as a special means of awakening God on behalf of the one who's fasting. There's too much of that that creeps in with a, with a lack of teaching, I think. Because this is not consistent with our God's character and care for His children. And it has resulted in much hypocritical fasting as described above. Listen, if you're doing things for the approval of men, even if you are the man that is seeking the approval, it's the same thing. In other words, if your fasting is all about getting what you want and somehow pursuing those things, just in the same way that we're told not to babble as the Gentiles or the pagans did, in a sense trying to awaken their God to recognize their needs, in the same way, fasting is not a means by which we are pursuing to awaken God on our behalf. I want to look at three descriptions that apply to proper times of fasting in God's child. And all three will recognize as natural reactions that unbelievers to some degree have. But obviously, in the pursuit of an unbeliever, have no spiritual value. Devotion, desperation, and discernment. Devotion, desperation, and discernment. The first one is devotion. Oftentimes in Scripture, we see fasting recorded as a response to sin, which has been recognized in the life of the one who committed it, has been repented or a change of mind, a different direction has come. And so fasting is a display of the devotion, which is replacing the rebellion of those who are fasting to the one true God. That's simply it. It's a display of the devotion that is replacing instead the rebellion. When God's prophet confronted Eli, Eli, when God's prophet Elijah confronted King Ahab with the sin and God's judgment upon him, he responded by humbling himself before God. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 21. I'll just read it. The account of this when Elijah went to him. And it said, It came about when Ahab heard these words, that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and he went about despondently. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. But instead I will bring the evil upon his house in his son's days. So we have this recognition that here's when the truth of God's word comes, there's an outward sign in many ways of the inward reality of repentance. When Ezra in chapter 10 confessed the sin of his people in intermarrying with pagan Gentiles, it describes his actions in this way in verse 6. Then Ezra rose from before the house of God, and he went into the chamber of Jehohananan, the son of Eliashib. And although he went there, he did not eat bread nor drink water, for he was mourning 
over the unfaithfulness of the exiles. And so we see this recognition of sin, even in a corporate sense, when the leadership of that national Israel would mourn and fast over the sin of the people. And of course, you know Nineveh. The response that was brought forth when Jonah's message, the, the, the message that Jonah didn't want to bring, because he knew the Lord was quick to forgive. And so we see this when they heard Jonah's, Jonah's message, their response is recorded for us in Jonah chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. It says, when Jonah preached, then the people of Nineveh believed, Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Do you see the, the order of that? That it was a, a belief in the message that had been preached that led them to then humble themselves. It says in verse 6, when the, Lord, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat nor drink water. But both men and beast must be covered with sackcloth, and let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. And so what we see is this expression was simply the reality of their heart. That with great desire, having believed in God and the word of God that had come to them, that they must call upon him earnestly, turning from the wicked way and the violence which had brought, the God, that had brought God's wrath upon them, repenting from those things. Now, to be clear, even unbelievers will fast or to put it in our terminology, will lose appetite during seasons of consequence. Even unbelievers, I've seen people when they're, they're facing the consequences of their sin, they can't eat a thing. I've seen them shrink uh, in size and lose weight when they're facing trial and consequence as the result of their choices in sin. But the key here for us is to see that the proper response in fasting is always from one who is seeking after God and not man. He's not wrought, overwrought because of consequences alone. He's not looking to those things. Instead, he's looking to being pleasing to God. A proper fast is one where a man recognizes his rebellion before God and displays his devotion to him in fasting and pursuing after him. It is not compulsory, but rather is an action flowing from an inner condition that is brought to bear. One of the ways that we recognize this and the distinction between an unbeliever who can go to a season of loss of appetite and a true believer who in that season is fasting is in Scripture it is always accompanied by prayer. In other words, seeking after God in the midst of circumstances of devotion, desperation, and discernment is the distinction between one who has lost appetite because of consequences and desires to have them removed from them and one who has lost appetite recognizing their sin before a holy and righteous God. True fasting is always accompanied by prayer. As one pastor has noted, you can pray without fasting, but you cannot fast without praying. It's the pattern in all of Scripture. You see, the seeking after God is what separates the fasting of unbelievers from believers. Much the same as it separates our prayers to our Heavenly Father from prayers which are offered to false gods. I was reading an update from one of our missionaries in Morocco, and he was speaking uh, about the season of Ramadan, which has a compulsory fasting attached to it, that all Muslims must fast during the season of Ramadan. It's this, it's this recognition that there is fasting in all facets of humanity. However, the distinction that sets apart Biblical fasting or proper righteous fasting is that it's in the essence of seeking after and recognizing God. This is what separates it. To be clear, we are not proving to God our devotion, but rather we are coming to a full realization and recognition of it within ourselves. I've seen in our day where a man turning from sin is so struck by the grief of his sin not merely the consequence, but the actual grief of recognizing, how did I do this before the Lord? Seeing how sin has dug its hooks and led him places he never thought he would go. That it robbed him of his appetite. 
In other words, it was an external recognition or a physical recognition of an internal spiritual reality. The second description of a proper response to fasting or in fasting is one of desperation. Desperation will lead us there. Just as we see uh, that the first one, the second one is desperation will lead us there. This often results from a great and desperate grief which has overtaken us. Whereby either from sorrow or longing, this desperation consumes us. There are multiple places in scripture when King David buried Abner. It records for us his grief and, and speaks in these terms in 2 Samuel 3. It says the king, meaning King David, chanted a lament for Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put in fetters. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was still day. But David vowed, saying, May God do so to me and more also if I taste bread or anything else before the sun goes down. Now, this is what's important for us to grasp. There's not one second of your life that is okay to be apart from a recognition of God as a child of God. We never separate out our, our secular and our spiritual in that way. Every aspect of a true follower of Christ, a true follower of God, is consumed by the reality of being that follower. And so all seasons are a time for God's child to be in recognition of Him. However, seasons of grief often result in desperate searching after him accompanied quite naturally in many ways by a loss of appetite the unbeliever will often also lose appetite in the midst of grief but this yields no spiritual fruit as it will do in a believer's life think about this in the same way and i heard a pastor say this one time and it resonates so clearly as my family is traveling back today if i were to receive word that they had been in an accident and as I was receiving that word and, and they were being rushed to a hospital and, and I was desperate to get there and be with them and see that they were okay and you came to me and said, hey, what's your favorite restaurant? I want to go to lunch with you today. There would be something else consuming that would drive me and all of my focus and my attention away from the normal practices of my day and focus me rather into the resulting need that is there. And as in all seasons, we are to be those as God's children who are recognizing Him, so also in this season. Another desperate season is one of impending danger, struggle, or as we viewed last week, trial. There's several pictures of this. The one that stands out to me, having taught through it, is found in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, and you know the account, Esther uh, was made queen uh, through some amazing providential acts of God. And in the process of that, there's a, a plot from a man named Haman that rises against the Jewish people. And no one knows that Esther herself is a Jew. And she is queen in the king's palace, and this plot becomes known. Becomes known. And so Haman goes and gets word to Esther, you, you must go to the king on, on behalf of your people. For do not think that you yourself will be spared uh, just because you are in the palace. But, but this will affect you as well. And, and she sends back, but you don't understand. If I go before the king and I have not been summoned, if he has not requested me, I will die. And he has not requested me. So you're asking me to go into all likelihood, which would cost me my life. And again, Mordecai says to her very clearly, listen, do not think. Maybe for just this season, maybe for just this purpose, you have been placed there. And then he says this, if you do not, God is still faithful. Protection will arise for his people from somewhere else. But you yourself nor us will be spared in this. And then we have this account in verse 16. This is Esther's response. In this face of impending danger, going before the king in the face of a, a horribly difficult struggle facing her people of a man who with power and authority desired to murder them. And this is what she said in verse 16 of Esther chapter 4. Go, assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens will also fast in the same way. And thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish 
And so recognizing this, there is an element where impending danger and other things places our focus in such a way that we go before the Lord in prayer, in all things in prayer, but also in that there's a measure whereby we forsake or forgo the common activities of our life so that our focus can be singular and specific. To recognize, it, look with me in Acts chapter 27, there's a unique account when I say to you that, that fasting or loss of appetite in these situations is something that naturally uh, unbelievers can also experience. We have this account in scripture where danger invoked a similar response from unbelievers. In Acts chapter 27, this is the account of Paul on a, in, in route to trial and imprisonment. It is upon a boat where a great storm had broken, it had risen up. And listen to verse 33. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. And so what I want us to see is that there are seasons whereby our focus is so extraordinarily bent towards something that it removes the normal aspects of our daily life. That's what fasting coupled with prayer and seeking after the Lord and both repentance and sorrow and need are absolutely a picture of. And so even as we see that fasting in the face of desperation is a natural response, it is only the believer who will do so unto God and not unto men, as unbelievers are simply responding to the realities of their bodies. But God's child will in times of desperation turn to his source even as his body is reflecting that need. The final description of a proper response in fasting or a proper pursuit is discernment. Discernment. We see several places in Scripture where desire for discernment lends itself to fasting on behalf of those who are seeking it. Now, this one's kind of the most unique. It's the one that lends itself most to mysticism and this idea of if I do certain things and do certain prescribed things, that it will, it will strengthen uh, the Lord's view upon me and, and somehow I can invoke his blessing. This is the, the one that seems to most lead to that. And so we saved it for last. I want to begin by recognizing that many false religions practice this one. But they often describe this pursuit as one for enlightenment. Meaning it is, it is a mystic seeking after some hidden knowledge. And that they're looking for a greater uh, depth of enlightenment or an experience of emotion or, or other physical attributes and aspects within their religious practice. There is a physical, medically established reality that we see whereby mental clarity is seemingly enhanced by the putting off of food for a season. Many people who have fasted will, will speak of it in this way, saying, after I got through the first three to five days of, of misery and struggle, there seemed to be a peace and a, and a mental clarity that accompanied that. Now here's the reality though, when you speak to unbelievers who have also possibly for a season of mental clarity or for a season where they were forced into it, fasted, they themselves will also describe similar things. Uh, so it's not uh, just those things. However, there is a sense whereby medically we recognize that there is a, a sense of mental clarity being enhanced by the putting off of food for a season. It is not the giving of dreams or visions, but rather a state of mental clarity which happens often between the third and fifth day of being without food. It does not last long. Because after a few more days, the lack of food often consumes the mind, making focus on anything else a great difficulty. And so when we see fasting for discernment practiced in Scripture, it goes along the same lines of everything else we have seen. In other words, it is always characterized by seeking specific understanding as it pertains to God's will. It is not simply for the, the blessing of the man seeking, but rather for the proper obedience of the one who is seeking to know it. Look with me in the book of Acts at chapter 13 as we wind down in our study of fasting properly. In the book of Acts, we see this as part of the process for both sending missionaries and appointing leadership over God's church. In Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3, he says, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Turn over one chapter to chapter 14. In verse 23, we see a similar account. It says, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The simple thing in understanding for us is to recognize that when we are making important decisions, we need to be consumed with a desire for discerning God's will. It needs to be one which we take so seriously in the, in the process of, of recognizing the things he has called us to, especially as it pertains to issues of leadership and the sending of missionaries to the carrying of the gospel, that in those times and seasons that we should be so consumed by, by pursuing the Lord and knowing his specific wisdom and will in that, that we lay aside the normal practices of our daily life in such a way that we can seek him with, with absolute devotion. Not to display that devotion as a means of, look what I've given up for you, God, now please give me my trinket, but rather in the means of, Lord, I must know this answer, and Lord, I will focus everything that I am even to the disregard of my physical daily needs. Understand this, it, to recognize that when we are making these decisions, these important recognitions or times in our life, we need to be consumed with a desire to discern God's will. Fasting does not invoke this. That's what I want to be clear from. You don't see in Scripture where fasting invokes this. However, it is an act whereby we set aside the ordinary actions in the pursuit of wisdom and discernment from our Lord, which he promises to give to those who seek it. That is the proper heart and desire which leads to fasting. Another thing about setting aside common practices in pursuit of the Lord, as a final note, the description of Jesus were specific to the culture concerning oil and washings and anointing. And they were simply a description uh, it simply described a person who recognized the truth of fasting as we have recognized it ourselves this morning. A spiritual practice displaying our devotion unto knowing the Lord's will, seeking him in, in the midst of this. And it was simply a guardianship the Lord gives for this person to guard his heart by cleaning himself up while fasting. From seeking the approval or pity of men rather Desiring rather their care, counsel, and reward be from him rather than the Lord. It's common. It can creep in so easily. Man, if they only knew. If they only knew the labor and the hours and, and, the, and the sacrifice that I've made on behalf of them, they would be so much more grateful. It, it creeps into every aspect of our religious pursuits. And so our Lord is giving just this very simple saying, a very simple command saying, Listen, do not do as the hypocrites do. Your fasting is your singular devotional pursuit of discerning and recognizing the Lord and your need before Him. It is not for you to practice that and then take it before men that you might receive these things from Him. This practice of fasting has nothing to do with discipline in regards to food. I've heard that several times where people say, well, it's just a good practice. It's good for us to be disciplined in the physical needs of our body. Paul spoke of that in, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. He says, I discipline my body. Okay, that's not what Paul was speaking of. Hey, he's speaking very specifically in regards to the pursuit of sin. And so I would say that this has nothing whatsoever to do with the discipline of, uh, in regards to food. But rather, we as believers are those who are always to be disciplined under moderation in all things. This is a specific response. Fasting is a specific response to a specific need whereby we honor the Lord, set apart and set aside the normal distractions of our day and pursue after Him with undistracted specificity. I love the good Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' words on this matter of our practice and appearance. And so let's close with them together this morning. This is what he says as it pertains to this section in Matthew. He says, the clear teaching is this. Forget your face. Forget yourself. Forget other people altogether. 
For it is this interest in the opinions of others that is so wrong. Do not worry about the impression, impression you are making. Just forget yourself and give yourself entirely to God. Be concerned only about God and only about pleasing Him. Be concerned only about His honor and His glory. If our great concern is to please God and to glorify His name, we shall be in no difficulty about the practice of these other things. For if he has forgotten himself and given himself to God, the New Testament says that that man will know how to eat and how to drink because he will be doing it in all things, all to the glory of God. Fasting is simply the recognition of our bodies in pursuing after, unfettered by any distraction, the needs of the Lord places before us. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we are thankful for your word, which brings before us difficult things, things that we wouldn't normally think of in our, in our daily lives and weeks. And yet, Lord, as we come to this section in Matthew, we're confronted with, with this truth about fasting. Lord, and, and we recognize that it's simple devotion and pursuit after you removing the, the fetters of distraction that creep in so easily. And Lord, intentionally even setting aside those things or possibly just recognizing that they have been set aside physically so that we might seek after you in all seasons of our life. Lord, I pray as we have closed that this would be the cry of our hearts, that we would be those who in everything that we do, we do so to your glory, to your honor, never for the recognition of men, never to the pleasing of men, for we would be of no service and of no value to you if we were seeking to please men. But Lord, as those who are set apart, singularly focused upon the mission that you have given us, laying up for ourselves rewards in heaven, that someday we might enjoy being in your presence eternally, worshiping you as those who are your bride. Lord, I pray that we would be consumed with these heavenly realities even as we face the earthly realities of the day ahead. We ask this in your son Christ's name. Amen.